Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Well, this is the first video I'm recording using my new setup with my new camera and microphone. So please let me know in the comments section down below if you can notice a difference in terms of the visual and audio quality of this video compared to some of my other videos. Hopefully everything looks and sounds better than it normally would. I think we're going to stick to this setup moving forward for almost every video, except for the guitar videos, because those videos were recorded months and months ago, ahead of time, on my phone. So, it's just going to take some time to get used to this new setup. I'm still learning how everything works. There's a learning curve involved. Hopefully it'll become second nature soon, and I'll get used to how everything should be put together from this point forward. Hopefully it'll become second nature to me soon. I think it'll be beneficial in the long run. It'll make the videos look and sound more attractive. Anyway, today we're going to do another episode of the Memory Lane series, the place where we take a look back at some interesting articles and interviews from old guitar magazines. My dad has been subscribed to Guitar World Magazine for about 30 years now. He saved a bunch of old magazines. He was kind enough to let me borrow some. So the one we're going to look at this time is the Holiday 2005 issue of Guitar World Magazine. Because we're only 137 days away from Christmas. Christmas is right around the corner, guys. Here's the cover. I'm going to share with you, I guess you could call it a mini interview series of mini interviews because the Guitar World staff went around they talked to a bunch of different guitar players and asked them each a question. They asked them to name a record that basically changed their life. Had such a monumental impact on their life that it inspired them to get involved with the music business. Obviously there are two different guitarists in almost every band, the lead guitarist and the rhythm guitarist. So I just chose one of those. I either picked the lead guitarist or the guitarist that had been with the band the longest. We don't have time to go through every name on this list, but we're going to go through a whopping 25 big guitar players and see what they had to say. Often we forget that all these famous guitar players were just like us. They used to be normal people like you and me. They were still avid music fans, but a lot of these albums that they're going to name actually inspired them so much that they knew they wanted music to be their career. At the end of the video, I'll share with you a tally showing how many had similar answers in terms of the name of the musician. Okay, so I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names or albums. I'll tell you the name of each guitarist, the album they picked, and then they'll give a brief description of why they love the album so much. Here we go. Starting off with Ray Toro from My Chemical Romance. He picked Ozzy Osbourne, Blizzard of Oz. My brother introduced me to Ozzy's music when I was 14, and right away Randy Rhodes became my biggest influence. I love the fact that he wrote such incredibly heavy stuff as well as D. A short classical piece for his mother and Goodbye to Romance, which is so different from any other song on the record. It just shows how remarkable his range is. After I heard that record, I was inspired by his mix of classical music and metal and started modeling a lot of my playing after his. I got interested in tapping because he used little bits of that in certain sections of his solos just to move up the scale or move up the fretboard. I also started playing classical scales. I think you can most directly hear his influence on my playing in the song Thank You for the Venom from Th Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. Toward the end of the solo, there's a really fast triplet run down the scale that's totally reminiscent of him. Next, Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. He chose ACDC, Let There Be Rock. I was 16 or 17 when I got this album. I remember taking it home, putting it on my cheap turntable, and dropping the needle down on the vinyl. 
first couple of notes of Overdose just blew my mind. The sound of the guitar was so untamed and it lit a fire inside me to approach the guitar like a weapon. The lore behind Let There Be Rock is that Angus and Malcolm Young would face a marshal against the wall and crank the sucker all the way up. You can tell the amp was turned up unbelievably loud. You can practically feel Angus's finger prints rubbing against the strings. Bon Scott instantly became a hero of mine because of the words he was using. I was a teenager and here was this guy singing about blowjobs, overdosing, and dating fat chicks. I'm thinking to myself, well, I haven't had the misfortune of dating fat women yet, but I sure do relate to the rest of it. Bon was singing my song. The more I got into ACDC, the more I started to develop as a musician. When I was a really young kid and learning music, I was very influenced by the British invasion. The Beatles, the who and the Stones, but when it came to developing my own guitar playing style, it was all about the new wave of British heavy metal. Some people will argue whether or not ACDC were a part of this new wave, but I do know there was a void between the British invasion and the new wave of British heavy metal, and that ACDC fell into it. When I think of how my style evolved, it was certainly influenced by bands like ACDC, Diamond Head, and Iron Maiden. If you listen to my style, even though it's sloppier, it contains essences of Jimmy Page, Michael Shanker, and Angus Young. But while Angus was always a hero of mine, I identified more with Malcolm. Rhythm is really important in rock and metal, and taking a percussive approach to the guitar is an art that's vital to the sound of that music. That's what Malcolm brings, and that's why ACDC is his band. To this day, I listen to Let There Be Rock, and it motivates me. That album marked the defining moment in my life when I made up my mind that was what I was going to do, no matter what. Next, Slash from Velvet Revolver, he selected Aerosmith, Rocks. I first heard Rocks when I was 13 or 14. There was this girl, Lori, and I'd been trying to get into her pants for what seemed like forever. She was the hottest chick in school and just exuded, no excreted sex appeal. One day I rode my BMX bike over to her place. We smoked a bunch of pot and she started playing me records. My parents were in the rock and roll business. And I was raised on a lot of music. The Kinks, The Who, The Stones, Small Faces, Animals, Beatles, Bowie, Led Zeppelin. So I'd already heard the stuff she was playing. Except for rocks. From the moment she put it on and back in the saddle started playing, I was glued to the album. She just vanished into the shadows. And I completely forgot about her. I had been into records by Black Sabbath, Zeppelin, and Deep Purple, but rock sounded like the Rolling Stones, who had been my favorite band from age 3 to 13. It had the blues based rock and roll thing, but turned up to 15. Aerosmith delivered the songs with such urgency, and the music had an almost punk attitude. With its powerhouse rhythm section and guitars that were all over the place, Rocks was loose and frenzied and I could relate to the emotional angst-filled vocals of Last Child and Combination. It wasn't pristine and perfect, but it gelled together perfectly. It's an amazing record. Rocks was also right up my alley because I was one of those kids. I was a bad kid in school. I had long hair and more jeans. I smoked. I didn't fit into the yuppie crowd. I was basically just a punk who didn't fit in anywhere. At that time, I knew nothing about the guitar. I'd been to a lot of recording sessions with my parents, but I didn't know anything about anything. But I always dug music, and Aerosmith's drunken, chemically-induced powerhouse sound just sold me and changed me forever. Rocks was aggressive, loud, and swaggering. It fit my personality perfectly. After I digested the album six or seven times at this chick's apartment, I just got up, grabbed my smokes, jumped on my bike, and went home. I never did get laid, but not too long after I picked up a guitar and I've been doing it ever since. Next, Kirk Hammett from Metallica. He went with UFO, Force It. I was 15 years old and a friend of mine brought it over to my house insisting that I had to hear it. I was still living in my parents' house at the time and they had a very loud stereo system. My friends would come over and we would blast it up to what we thought was concert level. Boy was I naive. The first track my friend played was Mother Mary, and I thought, wow, these guys are just as heavy as Thin Lizzy, Aerosmith, Montrose, and all the other hard rock stuff that I was listening to before I got into heavy metal. 
when it got to the guitar solo, I was just blown away by Michael Schenker's tone, phrasing, and technique. By the time his second solo came on with the fastest descending lick I'd ever heard, I was totally hooked. I immediately grabbed the album cover and saw the picture of Schenker playing a flying V. From that point on, I knew there was an entire rock vocabulary out there that was not just based on pentatonic scales. And I would set out to learn as many Shanker solos as possible while trying to write heavy riffs just like UFO. I also wanted a flying beast so bad. That record taught me a lot about solo structure, phrasing, and melody. As well as playing for the song. I was amazed how UFO could be so heavy and so melodic in the course of one song. I think the band I was in at the time added two UFO songs to its set that week. For me, the standout tracks on four sitter Mother Mary, Shoot Shoot, This Kids, Out on the Street, and Let It Roll. Every time I pick up the guitar and start improvising, I think a lick or two from that album squeaks out subconsciously. I probably spooed the most Shanker licks on Kill 'em All because everything was still kind of new to me at that time. Next, Steve Vai picked West Side Story, original Broadway cast recording. I was about seven or eight years old when I first heard West Side Story, and it had a huge impact on me. If you look at the elements of that record, it contains so many of the things I enjoy doing today. It has a historic melody. How can you compete with Leonard, Bernstein, and Sondheim? And the lyrics are wonderful. Along with its enchanting and exquisite melodies, West Side Story has attitude and a tremendous amount of frenetic energy. It's emotional, theatrical, and technical. It's everything. Because I was a young kid, that type of music represented a sort of freedom for me. It wasn't all groove or beat oriented, and it didn't fall within the confines of conventional pop song structures. These guys just did whatever they wanted. When I first heard it, I thought, this is what music needs to be, and you can see the influence in my approach. From the first note I ever recorded on my first solo record, I made a very conscious decision to try and work outside of the box. Next, Robbie Krieger from The Doors went with Bob Dylan, bringing it all back home. This guy from Marblehead, Massachusetts, who I knew in school named Bill Finnity, turned me on to Bob Dylan. We had a jug band called the Back Bay Chamber Pot Terriers. This was the same time that Jerry Garcia, Bob Weir, and Pigpen were playing in a jug band before they formed the Grateful Dead. But they were a lot better than us. Our only gig was for the Ladies Auxiliary. We played a bunch of Dave Van Bronk stuff. I was 19 and attending Santa Barbara when Bringing It All Back Home came out. I was taking a lot of acid in those days and everything Dylan said just really connected with me. There are a lot of great songs on that album. Maggie's Farm, Mr. Tambourine Man, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, Subterranean Homesick Blues is one of my favorites. That was actually the first rap song as far as I'm concerned. Dylan uses the words like notes. He didn't really care what they said, just how they sounded. I always liked the way that Dylan played guitar, although I never tried to copy the way he played. I was always amazed by how he could play guitar and sing or play harmonica at the same time. But the spirit of Dylan's music has always stayed with me through everything I've done with The Doors and the Robbie Krieger Band. Next, Joe Perry from Aerosmith. He chose the Yardbirds, having a rave up. That album was incredibly important to me as a young budding guitarist because it was set in a blues genre that I really gravitated toward, the raunchy, basic sound of the electric blues. The album came out with all the other stuff from England. The Beatles, Stones, Freddie and the Dreamers, Dave Clark Five and all that. For the most part, those were pop bands that seemed to have reached the unattainable. But when I heard having a rave up, I thought, hey, I can play that. That was the first album on which the guitar solos were as important as the lead vocals or the songs themselves. Up until then, a lot of guitar solos would just be there to take up a little space between a chorus and a verse. They were really organized and pre-mediated. But when you heard the guitar solos on the Yardbird stuff, you felt that Jeff Beck didn't know what he was going to play until he played it. There was freedom to jam. And that was the foundation for where Beck Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton, who all played in the Yardbirds, went later, and the psychedelic side of having a rave up was so hip too. 
The first term I heard having a rave up, I was at my friend Dave Mead's house. He had an older brother who was into playing and had a guitar. He also had a couple of Chuck Berry records, but it was having a rave up that I loved. I sat down and tried to play everything on the record, including The Train Kept a Rolling. That song has the archetypical guitar riff, proto everything. It still hasn't been topped. It's as simple as you can get, but it makes that rhythm rock. You can dance around with it. It still amazes me when we play that song in Aerosmith, which is probably why it's still a cornerstone of our repertoire. It's the one song Steven Tyler and I had in common when we met. His band used to do it, and it was the only song we both knew. Next, Mark Morden of Lamb of God. He picked Megadeth. Peace sells, but who's buying? <coughs> Peace sells made me realize that I could take all my adolescent rebelliousness and negative energy and craft it into something that was both sophisticated and dangerous. Basically, it made me want to be a metal guitar player. Before I heard the record, I was a 13-year-old skater listening to a lot of punk, Black Flag, Bad Religion, JFA, Suicidal Tendencies, JBH, and Sex Pistols. It was in that context that I got a guitar and started making noise punk rock style. When I heard Peace Cells, I was struck by its punk edge. It was really raw, chaotic, unrefined, and dirty, in the same way punk records were. It snarled and seemed to be giving the middle finger to everything. There was nothing classy about it, but at the same time it was smart and meaningful. I thought it was the best punk rock I'd ever heard. Except it was made by dudes who could play there. Off. I can still go back and listen to that record and get things out of it. The riff work at the end of Wake Up Dead is still a lesson to me. They flip time and veer off into odd time signatures. But they still maintain the groove and chunk. And you can make someone's head bob in 15 slash 8 time. You've really achieved something. And the socially conscious lyrics are great too. Megadeth seemed to be selling the idea that you can be rebellious and still be smart. That you can make a statement with your music and not lose any power or danger. That was a big influence on Lame of God. We've had the opportunity to work with P. Sells guitarist Chris Poland on two of our records. And those were among the coolest moments in my career. Next, Stephen Carpenter from Deftones said, Mez Hugga Chaos Sphere. This is the greatest metal record of all time. A friend of mine had a mix CD with some of the songs on it, and after I heard it, I bought the album at this little shop on South Street in Philadelphia. Even then, I still didn't know what to expect, but man, there's no sweeter band out there. Chaos Sphere gave me a whole new perspective on playing, with its unusual time signatures. Mez Hugga's Tuning alone influenced me. I've used seven string guitars on the last two Deftone records. Our last record was in G sharp, and the next one will be even lower. I'm on F sharp now. Plus, Mess Hug has got eight string guitars. I can't keep up. It's kind of hard to find the parts in Deftone songs that sound like Mess Hug unless you're looking for them. But they're there, little shifts in the music that give the songs their flavor. Next, Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones. He selected Elvis Presley, Heartbreak Hotel. You didn't hear a lot of rock before Elvis came along. I remember being 13 or something and listening to the radio under the bed sheets when I was supposed to be asleep. Heartbreak Hotel came on European radio station Radio Luxembourg, and I kept losing the signal. I remember actually daring to get out from under the blanket and walk around the room trying to get it back without waking up the parents. Next, Yngwie Malmsteen from Deep Purple, he picked Deep Purple Fireball. My sister gave me Fireball for my 8th birthday, June 30th, 1971, and that day my life changed forever. I knew immediately that I was going to be a guitarist for life, there would be no turning back. It's like one minute I was a kid playing with cap guns, then someone handed me a nuclear bomb. My life was never the same, to say the least. I had already started playing guitar. I had Hendrix and Clapton records in my house. And I liked the Beatles and the Monkees, but Deep Purple were it to me. When I heard Fireball, I didn't have many albums to compare it to. And even if I did, it still would have kicked my to and back. There is amazing guitar playing on it. Hendrix is godlike to me. 
But for a kid who wants to play guitar, the early Richie Blackmore solos were more challenging to play. I worked on the guitar solo to Demon's Eye forever until I could play it. There's no question that Blackmore was a big part of my development. I learned how to play the blues from studying him. He has a unique sound and look, and there's a cool mystique about him. There's no one like him. Next, Ace Freely from KISS went with Jimi Hendrix's Are You Experienced? I was about 16 when I first heard it. I remember walking around with it all the time. I brought it to school with me and showed it to everyone. I brought it to band rehearsals. I've lived with that album until someone ripped it off at a party. Of course, I went right out and bought another one. My guitar style was modeled after a lot of musicians, and Hendrix was definitely one of them, but even more with the music. What really influenced me was his attitude, the way he dressed, the way he looked. He was so anti-establishment. Nobody wrote music like him. I loved Are You Experience and Purple Haze. He wrote about LSD, he wrote about sex and drugs and rock and roll, and what was going on at the time. It was all about rebellion. He was so radical and ahead of his time that it just swallowed him up. I got a chance to meet him when I was 18. I snuck backstage at his last New York appearance at Randall's Island, and they ended up putting me to work with the road crew. Back then, they didn't have laminates or heads of security, and if you look like you belong with the band, they let you go backstage. I had hair down to my waist, lemon yellow hot pants, and a black t-shirt with a snakeskin star on it. So they let me in, but after a while they were like, who is this guy? But before they kicked me out, they said, can you do anything? And they put me to work setting up Mitch Mitchell's drums and working on the stage where Jimmy was playing. It was bizarre. Next, Sinister Gates from Avenged Sevenfold. He picked Mr. Bungle, Mr. Bungle. I first listened to it at my parents' house when I was 13. The Rev, Avenged Sevenfold's drummer, gave me some mixtapes that had a bunch of those songs on it. Listening to Mr. Bungle made me realize that there are endless possibilities in music. It also caused me to think and listen before I put my hands on a guitar. A few tracks that really stand out are Stub a Dub, My Is On Fire, and slowly growing death, but basically everything about this album is great. Next, Scott Ian from Anthrax. He chose Kiss Alive. I didn't hear Kiss Alive until about a year after it came out. I wasn't that into Kiss, and wasn't sitting around waiting for the album. But when I heard rock and roll all night on the radio, it got my attention. I think I was like 11 years old, and I'd been saving up my allowance money because I was supposed to buy a birthday present for my dad. I had like 10 bucks. I could buy either a present for my dad or kiss the lie, so I bought a live. <laughs> I actually gave it to my dad for his birthday, but I knew he would just say thanks and hand it right back to me. A live was really the first record I got into on my own, and it opened my mind to a whole other world outside of my parents' music. It was the first album that made me feel different, though I liked a lot of the stuff my parents listened to. Paul Simon, the Dewey Brothers, Neil Diamond, I never really connected with it, but when I first heard Alive, I felt the Kiss were singing to me, that their words were about my life. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I wanted to be them and do what they did. Since that first connection with Alive, it's been the same. With any record I've ever loved, I have to feel it. It has to move me. I guess it was a case of right time, right place. While well, Alive isn't the record that specifically influenced who I became as a guitar player or songwriter, Black Sabbath's Paranoid holds that spot, it is the album that completely changed my world. Next, Steve Stevens of Billy Idol. He picked Yes, Fragile. It is not exactly what people might expect from Billy Idol's guitar player, but for me, Fragile was the first rock record on which I heard a guitarist employ all the styles that I had been studying, from rock to classical to jazz. Around that time, I was taking some classical guitar lessons, and I had brought my teacher, Fragile, so he could teach me the Steve Howe instrumental mood for a day. He took the record home and ended up listening to the whole thing. He was the bona fide jazz guy, but after listening to it, he was like, this guy is really good. Fragile really opened my eyes to the stylistic possibilities of the guitar. With Billy Idol albums like Rebel Yell, I looked at songs like Hills and Valleys where you could build in different guitar textures and not just have one sound the whole way through. 
I realized this was possible when I noticed what Steve Howe did on Fragile. He treated his guitar parts like pieces in an orchestral arrangement. Fragile is one of those records that really takes you on a trip. It's an escapist record. Next, George Thorogood. He went with the Rolling Stones the last time. This was the record that really focused my interest in playing guitar. Beatlemania was about a year old when I first heard it. I had a picture of the Stones on my billboard in my room. When I first heard the last time, I looked at that picture and really felt that I had a purpose in life. <clears throat> that song was the turning point where I said, I know now what I'm going to do for a living, somehow, some way. The Stones had been the world's first underground band. They were not a commercial act. They were artistic and very proudly revolutionary in the pop world. And that appealed to me, growing up in conservative Delaware. I would get up every morning at 7 a.m. and play the last time twice. I'd go to the bathroom and then play it two more times. I'd eat my breakfast and play it two more times. My dad would be getting me off to school. It was just the two of us. A lot of dads back then would have said something like, Why are you listening to those female impersonators? When will it be the last time? Well, my dad said nothing, even though he was very much into classical music and not really a rock fan. Cut to 16 years later. I'm opening for the Stones in Philly. I'm backstage. I've made it now. I'm a success story. My dad is there backstage with me. And I say to him, Dad, how about this? After all these years, I'm opening for the Rolling Stones. What do you think of that? And he looks at me and says, They're not going to play the last time, are they? I said, No, Dad, I don't think so. And he said, Thank God. Next, Ted Nugent. He picked Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, Take a Ride. There I was just off stage at the Wald Lake Casino outside Detroit in 1962. A pearl white Fender Do Sonic weapon of mass construction smoldering in my all American greasy R&B and rock and roll dreaming hands. I had just finished my opening set with my band The Lords, jamming some Outlando, Sonic, Bombast, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, James Brown, and Motown masterpieces, feeling pretty cocky for a numb nut 12 year old white boy. I was quite proud of my high-energy tsunami of glass meets chrome primal scream guitar slamming and was about to watch a Billy Lee and the Reveras hump into their headlining set. I was intently checking out the amps and gear on stage when my band walked past to a screaming, frenzied welcome from the crowd. Billy Levi's Lee grabbed that EB664 microphone, bent way <coughs> over, and let out a scream that I thought only James Brown was capable of. As the long, lanky lead guitarist Jimmy McCarthy plugged the most gorgeous, hollow-body Gibson guitar into his Fender Twin Reverb amp, it was leaning back on its angled chrome legs. The bass player, Earl Elliott, jammed the cable into his Ampeg B18 and stretched his arms to reveal a black, silk-gloved left hand. Young Johnny Bandicek sat poised behind his drum set, sticks held like fighting daggers. Eyes glow while rhythm guitarist Jimmy Williams plugged his cherry red ES-335 into another twin. Then all broke loose and my baptism by fire erupted. Jimmy McCarthy spread his long legs, leaned way forward, and ripped into a full corded rhythm flash grind like I had never imagined could be done on guitar. When the whole band kicked in ferociously and pummeled their way through Jenny Takes a Ride, my life was dramatically altered forever. Well said, Ted. Next, Zach Wilde. I can't just give you one because there are several albums that made me the dysfunctional master of pottery and crochet that I am today. When it comes to great music, you don't just hear it. You get chills down your spine. Here's five that do that to me every single time. They all rank equally in my book. Without them, I wouldn't be able to play the way I do. Black Sabbath, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. I got divergentized by Sabbath before I started playing guitar when I was like 12 years old. They scared the out of me the first time I heard them. The mood of Sabbath Bloody Sabbath is really dark, but really uplifting at the same time. Ozzy's voice is just so melancholy and lonely, and the music is just so brutally powerful. 
Even the mellow stuff like Fluff or Spinal Architect sounds dark, lonely, and real. Sabbath is in my blood, and Tony Iommi's soloing influenced me too. As far as I'm concerned, he's up there with Paige Beck and Blackmore. Second, Ozzy Osbourne, Diary of a Madman. I remember coming home from school with one of my buddies, sitting in his room, putting this on and just going, Holy <coughs> I just started playing guitar and Randy Rhodes soloing altered my soul. I still practice it all the time when I'm on the tour bus. I learned how to craft a solo from this record. Randy was the master of that. His solos are a song within a song. Next, Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush, live. Sean McLachlan said the first time he heard Jack saxophonist John Coltrane play, it opened doors he didn't know existed. When my guitar teacher, Leroy Wright, placed this album for me. It was my Coltrane experience. It just blew my mind. I couldn't believe that you could play pentatonic scales like that. It's like blues on steroids, fast but with feeling. Next, Elton John, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. This is a flat out masterpiece. To this day, the production pretty much destroys everything else that's on the radio. Everybody playing in that band was sick, and when you coupled that with Elton's voice, piano playing, and writing skills, you've got perfection. Last, Van Halen, Van Halen 2. The first time I heard Eruption from Van Halen, it was totally mind-blowing. But when I heard Spanish Fly from Van Halen 2, I was like, you got to be kidding me. The great thing about Eddie Van Halen is that even though his solos are beyond sick, he's the whole package. An amazing rhythm player and an amazing songwriter. Next, James Monkey Schaefer of Korn. He went with Van Halen. Van Halen. I was nine years old when my brother got this album. He's five years older than me, and he was always getting into trouble. I remember him blasting Running with the Devil on his record player, and was thinking, man, if mom hears you playing this, she's going to kill you, and you're going to... and you're probably going to take me with you. At that point in my life, I didn't even know what a guitar was. I had asked my brother, what's making those crazy sounds? And he said, that's a guitar, you stupid. All the dive bombs, pick slides, hammer-ons, pull-offs, finger tapping, all that was so overwhelming. The guitar playing on Van Halen made me listen to each individual instrument for the first time instead of the band as a whole, and that got me turned on to playing the guitar. Next, Vivian Campbell of Def Leppard said, Thin Lizzy, Live and Dangerous. I was 16 years old and my friend Ramey Haller, vocalist slash bassist in Sweet Savage, played this album for me one day when I skipped school. I went to his place, as I often did, to listen to his vast record collection. Lizzy had two great guitarists, Scott Gorham and Brian Robertson, who worked well together and individually. Their twin guitar harmonies were immediately recognizable each could solo in a way that was driven in equal parts by flash and melody. They both came from the same blues rock mold and played Les Pauls through Marshalls, but they sounded different. Further proof that tone is mostly in the fingers. Still in Love With You is always the showcase for them to lean on their more melodic instincts, while Emerald had them both trading licks at a more furious pace. On these songs in particular, I got to examine the styles and tones of both players. I learned just about every lick off this album and a great deal of the substance of my playing today still draws upon what I called from the endless hours I spent absorbing this album. Next, Neil Scon of Journey chose Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced? When I was 12 years old, I heard some of the songs from this album on the radio, and they grabbed me right off the bat. At the time, I was living with my folks in San Mateo, California. I had already been playing guitar for a couple years. I'd been digging on the blues, and as soon as I heard the music that was coming from the UK, it grabbed me. It was blues, but a different kind. An electric improv blues with lots of jamming. It completely sucked me in and inspired me, because the sound was new and different. For the longest time, I'd switch between listening to Are You Experienced and Cream's Wheels of Fire. There were so many great songs on Are You Experienced, like The Wind Cries Mary, the song is melodic, slow, and majestic, yet very bluesy. I also love the title track with its backward drums and guitars. It was the first time I... 
heard something like that. I hear a lot of Hendrix influence in my guitar playing. He's someone I learned a lot from, so his electricity is a part of me. When I play live, I sometimes do a rendition of Voodoo Child, Slight Return, mixed in with Gypsy Queen. It demonstrates how much of an influence Hendrix has had on my playing. Next, Michael Shanker from MSG, Scorpions, and UFO went with Jeff Beck, Truth. I heard this album in a friend's house when I was around 14 or 15 years old, and it completely transformed me. I walked home that night humming improv solos. I knew I was on my way. I was unstoppable. When I arrived home, I took my guitar and practiced at a totally new level. It was a major jump start for me. Most important, I didn't try to copy Beck's lead guitar, but instead took inspiration from it. It was like the lid came off my inner well of creativity. It was around the same time that I heard Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Cream, Taste, Wishbone, Ash, and Deep Purple. From listening to these artists, I got connected to real rock music. I learned their songs and performed them with Klaus Mine in a band called Copernicus before he joined the Scorpions. Of course, there are many other guitarists I paid attention to, including Johnny Winter, Peter Frampton, Mike Ronson, Paul Kossoff of Free, Clem Clemson of Humble Pie, and Leslie West. Prior to any of this, though, I developed my foundation by listening to groups like The Shadows and The Beatles. In the years after, I was impressed by other guitarists like Eddie Van Halen. When I heard his two-handed tapping on the first Van Halen album, I said, How in the world is he doing that? I found out later, and then it became less sensational, especially when everyone was copying it. Technique has a limited lifespan. Besides, if you practice another guitarist style too much, you can't get away from it, and before you know it, you sound just like everybody else, which is exactly what happened in the late 80s. A cleaning needed to happen, and it did. Guitarists who play solos from the heart can perform every night, and will always sound fresh. When solos come from the heart rather than the mind, that is, from technique, they're always new. I can even copy my own lead breaks with the same feeling I captured on the original recordings. It happens only in that moment. Next, Warren Haynes of the Allman Brothers Band and Government Mule. He chose the Allman Brothers Band at Fillmore East. At Fillmore East would have been one of the albums that changed my life if I had never joined the Allman Brothers Band. But I have been a member for 17 years, so making this album my choice is an absolute no-brainer. It contains great music, not to mention countless licks from not one with two great lead guitarists, Dwayne Allman and Dickie Betts. I learned a tremendous amount just studying the approach the band takes on this record, which is to use the songs and arrangements as starting points for musical explorations. Knowing you could even do that in a rock context was very liberating. And for me, being from the South, the record gave me a sense that you don't have to play things a certain way or pretend to be someone you're not in order to succeed. My friends and I used to listen to it over and over literally wearing out the vinyl trying to capture every nuance and lick. I understood the concept of improv thanks to hearing great music from my older brother including Live Cream, Bluesmen like Alan Wolf, Muddy Waters, and Elmore James, and Jazz by Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, and Cannonball Alderley. Hearing at Fillmore East was like discovering the link between all that stuff and beginning to understand how improv can achieve a sense of perfection. Sometimes it sounds like there's nothing better the musicians could be playing and what they're doing off the top of their heads. That's when the band has reached something beyond the sum of its parts. It's like the coolest classical piece in the world. That's what At The More East sounded like to me, and still does. Next, Joe Satriani. He went with the Jimi Hendrix Experience Electric Lady Land. My older siblings turned me on to Hendrix when I was 12 or 13. By the time I started playing guitar in 1970, I had been able to absorb the first three Hendrix records in a special way. Of these records, Electric Lady Land had the biggest impact on me. It showed Hendrix playing in every conceivable context. As a backing musician to Noel Redding on Little Miss Strange, as a jamming ensemble player on Voodoo Child, and then as the Hendrix that we know from the first two records. Specific things were really mind-blowing for me like the back-to-back -back solos on All Along the Watchtower, each with its own unique personality. And of course, Voodoo Child's Slight Return was the ultimate tour de force. 
In 1983, A Merman I Should Turn to Be is the song that did it for me. My friends just wanted to hear Crosstown Traffic or Come On Part 1, the short accessible songs. 1983, man, that's the right there. I listened to that song and envisioned an entire life for myself. Last winter, my son Zizi and I were out snowboarding a lot, and we spent a lot of time driving together. He zeroed in on that song right away, all on his own. He's a young guitarist himself, and obviously his connection with that generation is distant. So I was intrigued and happy to see him connect that song just as I did. Last, Warren D. Martini of Rat. He selected Jimi Hendrix's Band of Gypsies. I was seven years old when I heard this album, and it's one of the few records I remember hearing for the first time. It was the summer of 1970, and I was living in Chicago. One of my older brothers put it on, and I remember walking down the hall from our kitchen toward the sound, stepping through the door and just staring at the record as it played. I was in awe. The memory is just so vivid. This is my favorite Jimi Hendrix live album, because the very times on it, like in the song Machine Gun, seems to transform from a performer into a transducer, channeling the emotions of a whole generation through his guitar. It turned me on to a new world of sound and sparked a desire to learn to play. Band of Gypsies was a great group. One of the things I love about this record and other live records from this period is the improv, the jamming. On the night this was recorded, everything was at its best, and the energy of these three, very musical, people to the components between the guitar strings and speakers. Well, the final tally turned out to be four for Jimi Hendrix albums, two for Ozzy albums, and two for Van Halen albums. Those were the most popular answers out of the 25 names that we went over. All the others were one. I think one thing that practically every answer had in common with each other, no matter who it was from, was that all those albums in some way inspired the sound that you get from those musicians. If you pay attention closely to what they've done, you can probably hear some of their influences seep into the melodies. So that does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.